so much. So nice. Hi there. Thanks for coming. It's nice of you to come. Um, and thanks for that nice introduction. We have um, 22 shops now. So wow. San Francisco, LA, New York, Tokyo, half dozen and most. Sorry if I stand here. I can see my slides. I can see my notes. I have my remote control behind the podium. Makes me a little more comfortable. Um, so before we start, I thought it would be helpful to give you a little idea of what I thought we should go over today. Um, I think we should talk a, a little bit about how Blue Bottle Coffee started, but not too much. A little bit about what I did before that, not too much. Um, I want to tour, we'll have a lightning round of slides touring um, all of our shops, and so that, that might be fun. Um, maybe, I, I know that the word case studies, I'm, I'm familiar with that word, we might have a couple of those. I know that people talk about those two words a lot. Um, and talk about constraints on our growth, a few things like that. Talk about the product, which is so important, maybe the most important thing, the people who make it. Um, there'll be a few slides. I'm getting better at PowerPoint, but I'm not that great at it. Um, I was thinking on the ride down about John Cage, Merce Cunningham. Has anybody studied John Cage, Merce Cunningham? Very good. Um, John Cage is a composer. Merce Cunningham is a choreographer. And they would work on pieces that were to be performed together, but they would never put them together until, until the actual performance. They'd work on them separately. The music and the dancing would go would be constructed separately, and then they just put them together. I thought it would be it's such an interesting way of thinking about PowerPoint. I would love to see a presentation where the slides were totally divorced from the content of the speech, and and you, the audience, would have to kind of project your own meaning into these <laughs> divergent things. So it might be a little bit like that. Um, so here we go. Yeah, so using the word slides, I usually use the word slides to refer to playground equipment. So that's, that's kind of where I stand with that. Um, so that's a coffee roaster. It's a ProBot coffee roaster. It's illustrated by Michelle Ott, who used to be our production artist at Blue Bottle Coffee. Um, I started Blue Bottle in 2003. And before that, I was a clarinet player. I was a classical musician. And that didn't prepare me very well for business, or did it? And so that's what we'll <laughs> talk about now. Um, so as a classical musician, as a clarinetist, I basically from age 12 to age 34, all day, every day, thought about my art, so I thought about getting better at the clarinet. Um, you know, I made a living. I was decent at it. I kind of got the jobs that I didn't want to get and didn't get the jobs I really wanted. Um, but it's hard to make a living, and, and I, I did some interesting music. Um, I had a dream of how I wanted to sound, but it was very hard to achieve that dream. It was this dysmorphic, sort of the sonic equivalent of anorexia nervosa. I could never really um, appreciate the work I'd done or how I'd done it. Um, and the longer that I played, sort of the more lost I become, became. I had this yearning to make beautiful art, and nothing ever seemed to be beautiful enough. It was a Hard way to live. Um, but I had a nerdy little hobby. Um, I would roast coffee on a perforated baking sheet in my oven. And it was a very sort of crude way of roasting coffee, but I loved it so much. Um, it, 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 you know, obviously it filled the kitchen with smoke and made my ex-wife, who was an uh, opera singer at the time, very angry with me. Um, but I got this idea of coffee being a fresh food. I was a farmer's market shopper, and um, I didn't see coffee being treated in the same very personal way, very fresh way that, that these great farmers that I would patronize treated their products. And I thought that was odd. At the time I was doing this, it was in the mid-90s, I'm afraid to say. It was a long time ago. Um, I, you, you literally couldn't find a coffee produced commercially that had a roast date on it. The, the, major, the major coffee roasters weren't talking about freshness in the way that I really believed was important with coffee because I would drink the coffee I roasted at home. Day one, it tasted a certain way. Day two, day three, it had an arc. 
It would peak a few days later and then um, decline. Um, and that was so exciting for me. That was very compelling for me, and I couldn't understand why the coffee that I liked so much that I roasted at home, I couldn't have that experience of drinking it somewhere else. Um, and so, you know, this idea of being so miserable at what you're doing that you have to find a change, you have to change something, um, that's where the idea of, of stopping playing the clarinet after so many years and going into coffee, chasing this nerdy little dream, that became more and more crystallized in my mind. Because the farmer's market is a great way of under, if you don't really know business, it's a great way of understanding commerce at a very basic level. You can, I mean, what do you do? You show up once a week, you give somebody money for something, they give you this thing, you know, the producer goes back to where they produce it, they farm it, they make it, and they repeat it. The next week they bring it back, you bring back some more money. You know, it's like, you don't need to go to business school to kind of understand how that works. Um, so that's what I did. In 2003, I signed a lease, um, 186 square feet, and in the Temescal District on 51st and Telegraph behind the restaurant Doña Tomas, the former potting shed. And um, I got a little roaster that roasted uh, about seven pounds, three kilograms. And... Um, I started doing it, and I didn't realize until I started that really I should have had more money, two credit cards, two musicians' credit cards um, weren't technically enough. You know, there, there are a lot of things I should have known, um, but I'm glad I didn't. It's good not to know things sometimes. Um, but what did I do? I'm going to skip oof, this one, 2002. Um, so that's how many square feet, that's how many kilograms at once I could roast. And that's where I did it, that little potting shed. Um, and you know what I loved about coffee is you know, I had this such attachment and dedication to the profound as a musician. Um, as a musician, we're constantly being shown the work of, of the West's great geniuses that we are exposed to the profound our whole careers. And that's a lot of pressure. You know, the profound is a lot of pressure. And um, what I realized that freed me in my life in coffee was it didn't have to be profound. It just had to be really, really good. Um, and really, really good is rare in the coffee business. It was at that time, and it's still quite rare now, even though it's a little less rare than it used to be. Um, but you know, this, this being freed from the shackles of perfection was very liberating for me. And I realized that there were certain habits I had as a musician that actually were very helpful for me in coffee. People think that what musicians do is they put on their tuxedo and they go on stage and they play their concert and go home. But actually, most of the time, what musicians do is they sit in a room by themselves with their instrument, doing the same thing over and over and over again, all day, every day, for many, many years in a row. And um, the, the, the task of a musician is to be slightly better at the end of the day than you were at the beginning. This notion of repeating to perfect, repeating, repeating, repeating to perfect. That was, a, that was the standard that a musician had. Um, other internalized standards were um, you know, I had the ability to imagine sensory outcomes. As a musician, you're constantly thinking about this sensory experience that you want to provide to somebody, to your audience. And as a musician, you're thinking about service, being in service to the composer, being in service to your audience. So that those, those attributes of being in service, imagining sensory outcomes, of repeating to perfect, actually are very helpful to me even now. I mean, what, is a, what do you do when you roast a batch of coffee at 17 <coughs> minutes? I, so you can be bored if you're roasting all day for you know, 13 to 17 minutes per batch, or you can be fascinated, or you can try to make every single batch slightly better than the one before. You can imagine a sensory outcome by cupping the coffee at the roastery. You can imagine sensory outcomes um, in terms of presenting them to guests. You can be in service of the coffee growers. You can be in service to the people that come into your cafes 
You can be in service to the people that um, are serving our coffee. So all of those attributes um, actually kind of came in handy, surprisingly so. Um, the one thing that I loved about the farmer's market is you go to see farmers little, Farmer Little at the Ferry Plaza Saturday Market, and he has the best potatoes, and he's got a 10 by 10 easy up, and he has his potatoes under them. You go to see Farmer Olson when it's clementine season, and he's got the best clementines. He's got a 10 by 10 easy up and he sells them under them. Hamada Farms, same. There's not a lot of marketing budget if you're at the farmer's market. There's not a lot of branding that goes on. What are they focused on um, wholly and primarily? And that is their product. Their product is absolutely primary. And that was a great lesson for me. That's how I felt about our coffee. That's how I still feel about our coffee, is that experience of drinking our coffee is absolutely primary. There's nothing more important than giving people that experience. Everything else, you know, um, sure, we have to think about how the logo looks and what color the walls should be and that kind of thing. But everything is about removing obstacles, everything in terms of design, and branding, that word. Um, everything is about removing obstacles to that primary experience of giving people this product. Um, so on that sobering note, I thought we'd take a little tour of our cafes, have a little break. Oh, sorry. OK. Yes, I will. Um, I'm not a mumbler. I'm more of a ponderer, I think. <laughs> but I'll try my best. So this is a kiosk. We'll talk about that more. Um, it's, oh, it's in, in a garage in Hayes Valley in San Francisco. A little kiosk. That's our shop at Mint Plaza. We'll talk about that more. Um, in San Francisco, also open on a peace-smelling alleyway. That's the ferry building. It's a busy place. That's our roastery in Oakland. Um, that's our shop on 18th Florida in San Francisco. That's Webster Street, or um, W.C. Morse Building, Upper Broadway, Oakland's first truck showroom. That is the most beautiful courtyard on University Avenue. That's our Palo Alto shop. I love that courtyard. Um, parenthetically, that style of architecture sprung from the 1915 Pan Pacific Exhibition. It's a very um, interesting history if you see the Spanish style buildings around town. That's Market Square, Sansom in the Financial District, the old um, Standard Oil HQ. And that's San Francisco. Then we opened in New York. We'll have more to talk about New York. That's our roastery. That's in Chelsea, Rockefeller Center, the High Line, um, Hell's Kitchen, Cobble Hill, Bryant Park. Um, and that's in Los Angeles. That's the roastery there. Arts District, Abbott Kinney, Beverly Grove, Echo Park, soon to open in Culver City. And that's Tokyo. Kiyosumi Shiokawa, where the roastery is. Aoyama, and soon to open in Shinjuku. So that's what we've done so far. It's taken 13 years to get that many. This time next year, we'll have maybe, instead of 22, we'll have 35. That's a fast lightning round. Um, the existing models when I was starting coffee, there were basically two of them. Um, this is the Pete's location in Walnut and Vine. That, that the, all the signs and symbols were around buying beans more than drinks, very, very darkly roasted coffee, um, scooped out of bins. It was a, a very, you know, it was very much about dark roasted coffee, not so much the flavors of the origin, but the flavors of the roast. Um, there's an art to that, and I'm not disparaging that model. I just wasn't interested in that. I was interested in more origin tastes, and I was interested in more layers and um, differenti differentiation of the taste of the coffee. Um, the other existing model was sort of this Italian-based, that's Cafe Trieste, Italian-based um, cafe that was kind of messy. Um, you know, the, when I was starting in coffee, there were, and there's still many, many cafes like this that are just sort of messy. They have like a, there are more places to rent space. They have couches and messy bulletin boards and 
and distractions from the coffee rather than focusing on the coffee. They've got muffins wrapped in plastic. They've got, you know, all kinds of, got 20 different fonts on display. You know, they, that's a definitely a model, um, but I feel like what I was interested in was the product first and what my task at Blue Bottle and our team's task at Blue Bottle is, is to focus on removing those distractions to give people this primary experience of tasting this delicious thing in the best way we can possibly present it. So when I opened, we, we did the farmer's market and that got very busy and it was very fun, uh, very stripped down, you know, no electricity, no running water. So definitely art was about constraints in that, in that way. And so case study number one, I guess you could say, was our kiosk in Hayes Valley. In 2005, January 23rd, 2005, we opened in Hayes Valley. And at the time, that um, alleyway was a dented alleyway that smelled like pee. It was um, not the most hospitable place to be, but I knew the friend of mine owned that building, and, he, and I didn't have enough money to open a cafe. And he said, well, why don't we do something in my garage? And I said, sure, and that, that's what we did. And it was very odd. It's still a little bit odd now, but it was a very odd place to open a cafe. But I think about the beginner's luck that that represented. Had I had more money, I would have felt the pressure to open a more traditional-seeming cafe. But this way, because the architecture was so different, the, the way that, that um, it subverted the expectations of the guests in an interesting way, I think it made them more receptive to having a radically different approach to making coffee. We ground everything to order and, and prepared all the brewed coffee to order. We didn't have it in urns. We had a six-drink menu, um, no sizes no flavors. Every uh, milk drink was steamed to order with latte art on the top. It was very, very different. Had I done market research, I would have asked people questions like, oh, do you want to buy coffee that's roasted lighter than the coffee you say you like? Do you want to pay a little bit more for coffee? Do you want to wait a little bit longer for coffee? Do you want to have fewer choices among drinks or sizes or flavors? And you know, I would have heard no, 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 and no. But fortunately, I didn't even know what market research was. Um, so we just did what we thought was the most delicious thing we could possibly do. And, um, and it worked. It was not so busy at first, but it, it totally worked. You know, we had the first PID-powered machine in California. PID stands for Proportional Integrative Derivative it's a way of regulating boiler temperatures to a very, very um, fine tolerance. And um, so we were, we're focused on accuracy and consistency. Right now, it's, you know, it's much more common to have those machines out now. But at the time, it was, it was a little bit of a Frankenstein machine. This guy I knew from the farmer's market, like he was a scientist or something, installed it. Um, so the fact that the surroundings changed people's expectations for, for, and made them more receptive to um, the coffee we were getting, the products that we wanted to put in their hands. Uh, that was a great lesson for me. Um, people, even, people now talk about like, oh, the coffee market's so saturated, saturated market. Um, and they were talking about it then too. I love that it's kind of a liquid metaphor to saturated market. Um, but it, you know, saturated then, it's saturated now, but it's also, what else is it saturated with? It's saturated with interest, it's saturated with passion, it's saturated with um, people trying to do great work, it's saturated with customers, um, you know, saturated with attention. And also saturated with a lot of models that aren't really executing super well. So I, I don't know if there's a generalization that's safe to draw, but I've always you know, haven't been too bothered about this idea of a saturated market. Here's a story. I was there long ago. I would roast coffee, and I would bring it over to the kiosk, and I dropped off coffee one afternoon, and I was hang kind of hanging out in the back, um, and a couple came, and it wasn't very busy. It wasn't a line, and, and there's a man and woman, and they were standing, and the guy, like, looked at the woman he was with, and there's, you know, it was pause, and he said, I like this place. He's looking around. And his person, he was there, like, looked at him. He's like, why? And then he thought for a minute. And he said, I don't know. 
and that's so memorable to me. Like, so did that creation of the ineffable. He couldn't put his finger on it. He couldn't say why he wanted to be there, why he liked to be there. And that was a very powerful lesson for me. There's so many businesses now that like try to beat you over the head with their message, their brand story. Um, but I think if we leave enough space, people can feel like they can relax and not be, they're not being lectured at. Um, they can think about it. They can pause. They don't have to be told what to think and how to feel. I like that. Um, so case study number one. Um, in 2008, well, to back up, I had a friend. I have a friend. His name's Jay Agami. He works in the Japanese coffee industry for a big co company called UCC. I met him at the farmer's market long ago. And he started telling me, filling my head with the way that people make coffee in Japan and the style and the culture of certain places that make coffee in Japan. There's a very old-fashioned, fusty, um, dowdy type of coffee house called the Kisaten. And he was talking to me about that. Um, and in 2008, I finally went there. And I went to this place. I went to a bunch of old-fashioned places the Kisa Ten, and I was totally blown away with um, just how they did it. You know, the perfection, it wasn't my taste exactly, but the perfection with which they were able to execute their vision and the very personal vision that they had in these Kisa Tens was uh, remarkably inspiring. It was stunning. The, and, and the connections with my former life, you know, they had absolutely mastered repetition to perfection. They had absolutely mastered imagining a sensory outcome and duplicating it. Um, it was coherent. It was just this rarefied excellence. There's this word called kodawari that's a beautiful word that sort of means the, the imprint of the founder, the maestro, whatever you want to call them, um, permeates the space. And this idea of kodawari was um, very strong in these places and very inspiring to me. Um, Anybody studying Jean-Paul Sartre? Very good. You're studying? Very good. You're setting a good example. He's a um, philosopher. I, I think it's out of his book, Nausea. Um, he has a line, everything has been figured out except how to live, which I think is very inspiring. But the Kisaten, being at the Kisaten, gave me a little glimpse of maybe how to live. Um, it felt like serving coffee was a moral act. It felt like a deep-seated sense of responsibility to the product and the guest. And the service felt the same as I felt, like in service to a composer, felt in service to this vision that they had. Um, so it was, it, I felt at home in these places. It was very strange to be 6,000 miles away and to feel at home. Um, I'll tell you one story about Hato, this place. Other places do it, too. You see that wall of cups behind the gentleman there. If you sit at the bar, you order something, um, first thing he does after he understands the order, he'll look at the wall of cups. Look, and be like, hmm, hmm. And it took me a few times going there to figure out, like, what was he doing? There's 150 cups. Just grab a cup, man. <laughs> um, but he was figuring out, like, in that moment, for my order, for this guest, what is the best possible cup to use in this context? What is the cup that I need to have my coffee in but don't realize it yet? What is the cup that's going to enhance my experience? Um, and that pause, I've always loved that pause. It's not very efficient. It is not very efficient. But it's um, really indelible, really, really indelible. Um, and this dedication to experience is something that we talk about a lot at Blue Bottle. Um, before we talk more about experience, I'd like to talk to you about this idea of, excuse me, um, three words. I was pressed to come up with a mission statement around 2008, and I was resistant. Um, and I had, I had a deadline. I had to go to this meeting. I had to unveil this mission statement. And I couldn't do it. I was, was 
I was practicing my excuses, actually, on the way to this meeting. It's like, well, I was really busy, or I had to do this, or this broke, or this failed. And, um, and then I realized that if we just got really, really good at three things, three words, if we could remember three words, that would take us a really, really long way. And the three words that I came up with in 2008 um, are oh, they're syncing up deliciousness, hospitality, and sustainability. Um, there's other words that we use now, too, at Blue Bottle Coffee. But those are the heart. Those are the ones, anybody that works for us, we say that one time, and they remember it forever. Um, they're important lessons. It's not always in that order, but usually in that order. Um, so I like the three words. We talk a lot about, oh, that's, uh, oh, and then, and then, being so inspired by Japanese coffee gear, Japanese modes of preparation, I found a great lease in Mint Plaza in 2008 and in a, a, a beautiful building in a horrible, horrible block um, that had since come up, um, but this gorgeous building, and that was the place where I was able to really explore a lot of my ideas about these Japanese coffee techniques. I didn't want to make a kisaten, but I wanted to make something that was our expression of it, that was our homage to these ideas about serving Japanese coffee as perfectly as possible. So. Um, that's Mint Plaza. Hopefully some of you will drop by. So we talk a lot about, ex about experience at Blue Bottle, and the more I do this, the more I realize that this taste of this coffee is negated. It's meaningless if people don't have a good time when they're doing it, that part of our product is the experience that people have while they are drinking it, or before, or after. Um, so thinking very deeply about removing obstacles, about having a great experience, making it clear, making it legible. Um, I think experience is the totality of sensory and emotional data, both unconscious and conscious, that we absorb. It's, you know, it's the taste of the drink, the sound the stereo makes. It's the anxiety of seeing a word you've never, that you might not know how to pronounce on a menu. Um, playlist. You know, what obstacles have we removed from people's paths so we don't have to have them think about it, we don't have to trouble them with it, um, those, is, it, is there a sincere human interaction, sincere, warm, helpful human act, interaction at every place before people actually need it? Those are the types of experiences we think about that are, are part of our product. Um, and th that's the thing that as we grow, we have to be very, very assiduous in making sure we're not just maintaining certain standards, but they're improving. There's this word maintain. I used to get asked it a lot. Fortunately, I haven't been asked it in a while. How are you going to maintain your standards as you grow? Um, and there is no maintain. You can't, you can't like hold on to this thing. You have to improve as, as you grow in order for this whole thing to make sense. We have to have this, this idea that we're getting better and better, and we're adding more things, we're being on a, a wider stage, but we're improving as we go. Because otherwise, that's a horrible way to live, right? Thinking about, like, oh, remember how great our coffee was in 2014? It's like, oh, yeah, that was really great. Um, nobody wants to live like that, and I choose not to live like that. Um, so everything we do at Blue Bottle is with the assumption that we can improve the experience and the coffee that people have as we add cafes, as we add employees, as we add guests, as we add... Um, coffee growers. Um, and then there's moments. Um, moments, I feel like, are subunits of experience. Moments accrete to form these experiences. It's, um, it sounds kind of weird. It's a future memory on display when we're thinking about cafe design. I think about like little moments that people might have. And um, there's this philosopher, Henri Bergson. Show of hands. You're my new best friend, Jennifer, um, that wrote a book called Mind and Matter um, that talks about memory in that way. We don't have to go into that necessarily, but um, it was very interesting for me to see how that is connected, that you can have, you can plan, you can premeditate a beautiful experience for someone, and they can have that experience without actually participating in it. It's If you see a little nook, you're in line, you see a little nook, you see a cozy place, you see somebody eating an affogato or something delicious, you can have that moment of 
having an, a, a memory of that experience in the future, and that creates a desire. And so this, this um, idea from Henri Bergson has been very interesting and important to me when we're talking about cafe design, to let people see and plan for something beautiful in their future as well as have something in the present moment. Um, and, you know, and there's, there's things that we want to get out of people's way. You know, I'm going to have that slide. You know, that's what we're trying to weed away from people's experience. You know, that is a sad face emoticon right there. You know, you've got like an empty sugar um, container. You've got drips. You've got a dirty glass on the, on the condiment counter. And those are the things, even if you don't notice it, even if you don't take sugar in your coffee, you're going to project that moment into your future, too. It's like, oh, maybe not consciously, maybe, not sub, maybe only subconsciously, but you're going to see that, and you're going to see a lack. It's like, oh, if they can't keep their sugar filled, what else can't they do? If, you, if I'm noticing that, you know, what else is lacking that I'm not noticing? So I stress a little bit about moments like that. And we have our successes and our failures, and nobody's perfect, but it's moments like these that I'm working very hard with my team at Blue Bottle to try to weed out. Um, so that's the future. You know, we're working on different ways of experiencing our coffee, ways of removing barriers to enjoying this experience of our coffee. Um, this is a shop we're opening in Berkeley on Shattuck and University, a very busy corner. Um, and the what we're experimenting with is this notion of gathering. Um, a counter is a barrier. So um, how do you remove those barriers? How do you let people interact as they choose with the baristas? Sometimes people just want to say the word coffee and have somebody make something delicious. Other times people want to enjoy the process. People want to have a moment of seeing somebody else enjoy the process and projecting themselves into the, that future, that possible future for them. So. The more we think about experiences, the more I feel like the act of designing a cafe is to strip away, to remove everything extraneous, to remove barriers from these experiences and moments. And you can do it yourself. Um, a gentleman I work with, a very inspiring gentleman I work with, his name's Arian, and um, he's our head of store design. When I met him, he gave me a little graph like this. It's called an emotional... <coughs> journey map. Um, it's, it's quite common. It blew my mind, but it's quite common in the design field. This was a little, I, don't, I didn't write down the cafe, right? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, this is a cafe up in Sonoma County um, that I went to. And all it is is sort of a sub, it's a subjective emotional map of how I'm feeling at certain points. And um, if you do this enough times, I have like a little note taker on my phone, and I do this every so often still. Um, you know, it was a bummer of a time I didn't get my toast. It started out so great, there were cute dogs in front. You know, but you do this enough time that you realize everybody does this when they walk into a place, that you do this every time you like catch the bus or you wait for an appointment. You know, there's this, this emotional journey, this, this uh, turbulence. You know, maybe it's on a small scale. You know, at the end of the day, me not getting my toast wasn't wasn't that shattering for me. Um, but, you know, it, it was very illuminating for me to do this, and I encourage you to do this yourself if you're interested in any form of retail, any, any form of, of experiential <coughs> pursuits. I encourage you to do this and just see, see where you are. It's, it's, it was um, very interesting for me. You can do it in a large scale like this um, when you go have some retail experience. And then um, when we were getting our new serviceware made, there's actually a little journey that I projected into the future of guests' experience when we were having it made. Um, the emotional journey that I was thinking of was three steps with this new serviceware. You'll see it in Palo Alto if you see it. So the first is if you see the serviceware from a distance, it just looks like white cups, you know? No big deal, white cups. You get closer and you realize that they're not perfect circles. There's an organic shape to them. 
they're um, a little bit more huggable, they're um, a little bit more, uh, you can be, show more affection to them, I guess, that they, they, um, they encourage that. I think those organic shapes. What you don't know is that these cups were made for us by a company called Quinto, and the proportion of the cups was exactly to our order. So each cup to the milliliter is exactly the volume that we have asked them to make. And so the experience you don't understand when you're interacting with those cups is that the proportions are exactly as we want them. And then the final step is obviously the cup goes on the saucer and then you're drinking your cup and you don't see the logo anywhere else. You don't see blue bottle, you know, look over here. Um, we're not grabbing people's attention, but we're allowing them to notice and hopefully be charmed by this moment of seeing the logo under the cup where it belongs. Coffee should be primary. The logo should be underneath. And so even for something as simple as thinking about serviceware, you know, you can think about so much emotional turbulence, so much journeying, so many stories. Um, I'm wondering if you think it's very exhausting to live with me. Um, <laughs> actually, yes, yes, it is. Um, so that's the end of that experiential part. Um, we walked away from 20% of our revenues last year. Ooh, that got your attention. Um, we used to do coffee wholesale for many coffee companies, especially very good ones. It can be 70%, 80% of their revenue. It was never huge for us. It was 20%, but 20% is not nothing. Um, and I remember this moment. I was in Los Angeles. I stopped at a very good coffee place in Silver Lake. Um, owned and operated by a very good roastery, had a nice time, walking back to the car, it's like two blocks away, and I see a gelateria, and they say, you know, proudly serving this coffee roaster's coffee, and they misspelled the name of the coffee roaster, and it, the, like, their sign was right across the street and down. And to me, that really summed up the perils of trusting somebody else to care about your product. Um, Nobody loves your coffee more than you do. That's just the way it is. And so with wholesale, um, I was feeling more and more out of control about the experience we were giving people. I would, you know, people start with the best of intentions. Nobody signs up with a coffee roaster with the intention, oh, we're going to serve your coffee horribly, you know. But nobody has that intention, but that's how it works out. Because if you stop caring just for a little, little bit, then, um, you know, all hell breaks loose sometimes. And you get stuff like this. Um, we confiscated that from a wholesale account. And, um, you know, people just freelance your logo. And, and um, anyway, it seems to be much more shocking to me than to you. But trust me, it was a horrible <laughs> sign that we did not want out in the world. So we made a decision, a tough decision, to walk away from wholesale, walk away from 20% of our revenue in the service of our future guests, in the service of the growers of our coffee, in the service of the people who are producing our coffee um, at our roasteries, in our four roasteries. So we don't do that anymore. And it's been great. It's allowed me to focus. So that made my life a little happier. Um, it's been great for everybody who works at Blue Bottle to just focus in. It's been a real point of pride with people who've been around the coffee industry for a long time and know the perils of coffee roasting um, for wholesale. It's been a real point of pride that we don't do that. Um, has anybody ever read The Myth of Sisyphus by Camus? Very good. Hands are shooting up left and right. Um, and that's kind of like, it's kind of what it's like in wholesale, coffee wholesale. You know, the boulder always crashes down. And, you know, you train people, you hope for the best, but um, at the end of the day, the boulder always crashes down. Camus' point was that Sisyphus was basically a very happy man because he knew what the task ahead was. But for me, it's like I could never, I could never really get there.
Um, so um, let's see. I don't want to talk forever. So we've had a couple acquisitions. We've had a couple funding rounds. Um, just to go over those closely, so the, the, the history of that. In 2008, there was a small minority investment, and I worked with a, a very smart, insightful gentleman named John Eastburn that worked for Kohlberg Ventures. That was a little bit of my um, graduate school, I guess you could say. Um, I was introduced to Kohlberg Ventures by a nonprofit, an Oakland nonprofit that I have a lot of affection for, called Inner City Advisors. They match up growing businesses with pro bono business advice. Literally, when I met with Inner City Advisors the first time, I did not know what P&L stood for. Um, profit and loss. Very good. And then um, there was a larger round in 2012. That's where I met my business partner, Brian Meehan, who's now the executive chair of Blue Bottle Coffee. Also a Stanford graduate, business school graduate, David Bowman, who is now CFO and COO. It's got a lot of letters, David does. Um, and so that has really helped us, helped me kind of step back from the financial part, from the fundraising part, from the um, stuff I won't, I won't do part, and concentrate on things like spending a lot of time on serviceware, spending a lot of time on store design, spending a lot of time on how the coffee tastes, really focusing. Because the one thing is I take this very personally as you might have noticed, um, because it's personal. You know, I started it in 186 square feet, and I basically did everything. Um, I, you know, designed a lot of the shops. I still have a, a, a lot of input in the design of the shops. I remember, and, you know, and, and my son used to, my son Dash was 12, and he used to come with me. He used to tag along, and, you know, just like little things like... Uh, those are the approved plans from our roastery in 2009. It was, um, you know, I, there's this health inspector in Alameda County. I won't say his name, although I am tempted to. Um, and it was just so grueling. It was so brutal. I had to call in every favor, everything I could do to get those plans passed. So when um, we got those plans passed and we could had permission to build our roastery, it was a, a an amazing moment, and so my family has shared in those moments from uh, the very beginning. And even though we have 22 now, we might have 35 this time next year, it feels no less personal. Um, and so I, on that note, I want to talk about constraints on our growth. Um, there's a composer named Brian Eno. He has a great line. Any constraint is part of the skeleton that you build the composition on including your own incompetence. Um, and I, that really struck me when I read that. I think he's a very smart and good writer. Um, and the first 10 years of Blue Bottle, the formative first decade, you could say, were really built around um, my own incompetence, um, my failings around not being capable of making certain compromises, not being too devoted to efficiency, the quirks of my taste, the insistence on finding an underlining narrative around everything we were doing, about having a deeply personal level of control over hopefully what is a charmingly didactic tone of voice. Um, all of these eccentricities and missteps kind of became uh, sort of our founding path. Uh, and they filled our shops. They made us interesting to guests. And so this, the question you know, we're facing, I'm facing, and those of us at Blue Bottle who are working on growth are facing is like, how do you scale incompetence? How do you scale inefficiency? Um, you know, um, that's a real challenge for me. Um, as we add smart, accomplished, pedigreed, experienced people to our growing business, there's a temptation to do the things that smart, accomplished, pedigreed, um, experienced people do them, which is to say not the way I'm used to doing them. Um, and so that's my quandary. You know, how do I make a case for the illogical? How do I advocate? How do I be an advocate for the incompetence that got me here talking to you at Stanford University without <laughs> fatally hampering um, the financial or operational success of our business? Um, charting a path forward that improves 
the experience of our future guests, but still keeps this, this, um, this idea that everything is not perfect in terms of the functioning of the business, that it should not be perfect. <coughs> that perfect is, that sheen of perfection is, is one step away from premeditation, um, which is one step away from staleness. Um, and so, yeah, our guests are counting us to be better and better every year. And how do we do it? That's the question. I'm not sure. Um, I do know that doors open for us. Um, they have for the last 13 years and probably for the next 13, I happily suspect. Um, but I have gotten used to solutions presenting themselves at just the right time. Doors open at just the right time. There's um, an author I love. His name is Marcel Proust. He wrote a novel, a very long novel called In Search of Lost Time. Jennifer, hands up. Yes, you know that. Very good. Anybody else? Show of hands. Hmm. Um, anyway, the, in the second volume, um, there's a great passage that really gave, gave, gave me hope when I came, came across it. It's, um, speaking of doors opening, it's the, the passage goes, but sometimes illumination comes to the rescue at the very moment when all seems lost. We have knocked on every door and they open on nothing until, at last, we stumble unconsciously against the only one through which we can enter the kingdom we have sought in vain for a hundred years. And it opens. And that image really stuck with me. And um, so hopefully, with all of our team's help and a little bit of help from Mr. Marcel Proust, we will continue to figure out how to scale in competence in an interesting way. Thank you. All right, there's questions and answers. Yes, first hand shoots up. How about you? Well, uh, first of all, I really like your coffee. Thank and, you. Uh, the, uh, the coffee you have in Toyota. So I was wondering, I, you know, the first time I got a bunch of coffee, I wanted to go back to your website and write a review about the coffee on the website, read the coffee so that others can you know, um, see how I felt about the coffee and then uh -huh. read somebody else's comment about it. Hey, I, I like twin colors and I like you know, three Africans, right? Uh -huh. So when I went to your website, there was no way, because you really emphasized on products and experience, right? Right. There was no way for me to like actually figure out from the direct source, that's your website, that how somebody else felt about, let's say, three Africans or Twinkle or, you know, uh, Beta Blanc for that matter, right? Uh -huh. So what, what's the plan? How do you incorporate that kind of experience? Because that would directly feed you what people are thinking about the coffee, how they're going to be Yelp and writing about it, right? Oh, yeah. do you incorporate Don't get me that? Started. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The the it's a very interesting question. So we have a gentleman who's very um, interested and passionate about our coffee, which I think is really lovely. And he was saying, why don't we have a mechanism on our website whereby he can write a review of that coffee, or others can, um, or he can read the reviews written by others. Or even rate your coffee, right? Oh, rate them. Yeah. Mm. Multiple ways of What's the plan? What do you think? Uh, no. Um, I'm deeply, deeply interested that you have a great experience with your coffee. If you do not, and you email support, and you say, ah, oh, this twinkle thing, I hated it. They're going to they're gonna apologize, and they're going to get some coffee to you that um, they think you're going to like. And that, to me, is critical, the, this exchange. The cacophony of online reviewing, that seems like something that I don't really understand. Or frankly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want, I would die a little bit if like I saw like, you know, these streams of reviews that we couldn't control or edit. Um, obviously, I want to make everybody happy, but I want people to, to talk to us about it. So that's just my cultural issue with that idea of online reviews. It's not disparaging your need for that. And you know that is a miss that we can't provide that for you. But I don't think, in terms of engineering resources, that that would be the top of our list to do that. Sorry. Try to me. Yeah. Yes. Anybody else? I just want, I don't want to like, have all 
the front. Okay, but I will. Okay, you, yes. <laughs> No, we um, don't. Like, or yes, I was. I can like walk over to our um, Y2E2 and I see like a little like eight bottle of coffee like already made that's available. Right. So since the um, surrounding experience is such an integral part of mm -hmm. your, your coffee philosophy, how do you reconcile yourself to have already made coffee in like venues that might not be like blue bottle? Um, oh, yeah. So the question is we have these very cute little cartons of our New Orleans style iced coffee that are in many, many Whole Foods and other places and cafeterias, and we're soon to release a black coffee. So for me, the critical distinction is we're not trusting anybody to make that coffee. We're not asking anybody, here are the rules for preparing it. You have to stick to the rules. What we're doing is we're saying, this is a product we totally believe that's just as delicious as what we get in our shops, and why shouldn't you go to Whole Foods and buy it so you can have an awesome trip to the beach? Um, you know, it's a way of scaling exactly our intentions. Obviously, we have to trust that the, you know, the checker at Whole Foods is going to be nice to you. You know, there, there are things that are out of our control, but the, the primary participation in the product is, in fact, 100% under our control, provided they get it to you during the date they, they should get it and they don't leave it in the hot sun. You know, like all those basic things that we can trust Whole Foods to take advantage of. So I, for, in my mind, it's a very critical distinction between trusting somebody else to make something for a guest under our flag or a product that we have absolute control over. Last question or is it? Yeah, one more. Yeah, okay. You've been very persistent, all right. Uh, very few companies have the attention to detail in terms of the product that you do. Mm. And I was wondering what you think might inspire more companies to try and have that same pride in their product that you do. I feel like everybody, oh, sorry, 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 thank you. Yeah, the, so he was very nicely mentioning that he thought we had a lot of attention to detail and that, and if I'm understanding your question correctly, why do you think others don't have as much? I, I don't think anybody admits, like, ah, I don't care about the details, you know? Um, and in point of fact, that slide that I showed to you sh shows you that we are not in control of everything I would like to be in control of, you know, in terms of the, that dirty cup and the sugar being out, although we try our best. Um, so I think everybody tries hard to have attention over details. Everybody says it's important, but do you invest in it? Do you have processes in place to execute it? I think that's the critical difference is the investment and the energy. I don't think it's about the intention. Okay, thank you very much, Jane. Thank you. Thank you so much.